Let us pray. Father, we come before you again so that we can receive the deal from above. And so that as you have planted us as trees of righteousness, our leaves shall not wither. Our fruit will not fail. And there will be no dryness in our Christian experiences even though we live in a weary, thirsty, dry land. Lord, we're praying that the freshness of spiritual life will be ours every time. Amen. We plead that your Holy Spirit will continually be upon us, within us, and around us. That sweet Holy Spirit that guides, comforts, energizes, and makes the revelation of, of God fresh to the heart all the time. We pray that you will be with us. Amen. Not only today, but every day of our ministering lives. In Jesus' name I pray. In Mark chapter 6, verses 30, 31, and 32. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they are taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no rest, no leisure, so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by sheep privately. It's very needful or necessary for us to talk on the freshness of the minister's life. Not just so much as we'll be able to keep all that we have learned at the Congress. That's necessary, but that's not the major reason for considering such a topic. Every minister with purpose of heart to fulfill God's daily will and his total plan for life must take a message like this to heart. The common experience of ministers of various persuasions ministers of different denominations and in many national territories is that there is weariness, discouragement and dryness in spiritual experience as the days go by in administration. Busy ministers like us stand the danger of drying up. The busier we are, if we do not know anything on how to keep our lives fresh, the busier we are, the more likely we are to become wells without water, wither trees without fruit, vessels without divine treasure, or prophets without revelation or unction. The disciples of Jesus Christ stood in that danger. And because of that, Jesus Christ himself told them, as we have read in the record given by Mark, that they needed to come apart just by themselves alone so that they will have time to rest 
rest the mind, rest the brain, rest the body, and rest the spirit from too much of activities. There have been individuals and groups of people who have not been able to retain spiritual freshness or abide in continual fellowship with God. Galatians chapter 4, verse 15, refers to the believers in this province. And Paul the Apostle asked them, Where then is the blessedness you speak of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Paul the Apostle pointed out in the lives of these people that the freshness of love Affection, unity among one another had not continued with them. He said there was a blessedness that they testified of to be their experience in the days before, which at present they didn't possess. In Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse one unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write this thing says he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks I know thy works and thy labor thy patience and how thou canst canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has patience for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted obviously the pastor pictured here must have been a busy pastor yet is being busy did something to him. He did not keep the freshness of his love. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 4, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. We have an illustration from the life of Job. The sickness that came on him, the calamities that happened to him, even though they did not totally destroy his faith in God. Once in a while, he will still raise his head above the sea and say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Yet, all those things made him to enter into an experience of spiritual dryness. And in his confessions, we have some enlightenment on the state of dryness or the loss of freshness. Job chapter 29, reading from verse 2. Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me, he was looking back at his walk with God, his experience with God, and he desired the spiritual life of 
years before or months before and he said how I wish I were as I was in months past in the days when God preserved me when his can candle shined upon my head and when by his light I walked through darkness as I was in the days of my youth when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me. He was going through a period of spiritual dryness, and he confessed that his state at the time he was saying this was not like it was before. When I washed my steps with water, and the rock poured me out rivers of oil. He was saying there was much anointing in the months before. And it appeared that even the rocks seemed to pour out anointing oil upon him. But because he put everything in the past tense, we understand at the time he spoke, it wasn't like that anymore. Verse 13, the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. He was saying he himself was so happy he could make others happy. But in the situation he was at that time, there was so much sorrow, and there was so much mystery, what he couldn't understand. And he had missed out on the revelations of the Almighty that had been with him before. He didn't understand anything now. How could he cause the widow's heart to sing and rejoice again? I put on righteousness. I closed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. I was eyes to the blind. And feet was I to the lame. I was father to the poor. And the cause which I knew not. I searched out. He said he could find out interpretations of things. And we ministers have known that there were years in our lives when picking up the Bible, the Holy Ghost was so real, he was a real teacher, that the moment we picked up the Bible, we could search out things from the Word of God. But ministers who are sincere, they know that there have been times they have passed through dryness. That to prepare a single message will take perhaps days. They open the Bible to search out instruction for the foolish, to search out strength for the weak, to search out light for those who are walking in darkness, and it appears there is no meat, there is no food, there is no supply coming from the word of God. They read, everything is dry. And they could remember when they were fathers to the poor. And the cause they didn't know about, what counsel to give, what instruction to give, what interpretation to give, there was a time they could search everything out because the freshness of spiritual life was upon them. I, and I break the jaws of the wicked and plug the spoil out of his teeth. Many ministers will remember in days of spiritual freshness when they could break the jaws of the wicked one and deliver the oppressed and deliver the tormented out of his teeth. Then I said, I shall die in my nest. And I shall multiply my days as the sand. My root was spread out by the waters. That was the secret. The root of his life spread out by the waters. And the dew lay all night upon my branch. My glory was fresh in me. My bow was renewed in my hand. Verse 23. And they waited for me as for the rain. Wasn't there a time 
when church members will come to the church waiting for the pastor as we wait for the rain, bringing their empty buckets because they knew as soon as the pastor comes and he opens his mouth, the rain will begin to fall. But Job said that was in the past, that they waited for him like that. They opened their mouth wide as for the latter rain. But sometimes times come in the life of the preacher that that freshness is no more there. And all that he can refer to will be all these things in the past. In Job chapter 9, verse 11. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. You see, all that I read to you in Job chapter 29, he put it in the past tense. He said, this is what I was before. I was fresh. I had anointing. I had understanding. I had joy. I had help and succor for the people. But now he puts this in the present tense. In Job chapter 9 verse 11, he said, Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passes on also, but I perceive him not. Job chapter 23, verses 8 and 9. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. I'm backward, and I cannot perceive him. On the left, where he doth walk, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. Then he said, but he knoweth the way that I take. He knows what I've been living on, how I love him, how I try to do my best. I can only decide then, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold and so we know that like we have read in Job there would have been times when the freshness of our original Christian lives would not have been there to help ourselves further what are the evidences of spiritual dryness one when there is no fresh understanding of scripture. And all the scriptures will depend upon now for teaching, for preaching, will be the scriptures and the understanding we acquired in the years of freshness many years ago or many months ago. And if we have found that there's no fresh understanding, fresh inspiration, when you pick up the scriptures, you are passing through a wilderness experience, an experience of spiritual dryness. Number two, when there is no depth of relationship and fellowship with God, and the life becomes superficial with no challenging victory that we just live from day to day no depth of relationship with God the new convert who is fresh in his spiritual life he picks up the Bible when he reads there's so much revelation that he might show somebody who had been old in the Lord and say brother look at what I see in the Bible and the brother looks at it and wonders what this new convert is seeing because the old convert cannot see anything. And there is no revelation at all. And you can tell in the preacher's life, all he can do now is to repeat himself. When those who come to the church regularly, when they come to church, either on Monday for Bible study, or Tuesday Bible study, or Thursday revival hour, or Friday revival hour, or Sunday fellowship. And these members of the church have been writing notes 
when you come to church that particular time and they hear the pastor announce his topic, they can go back and say, yes, we preached that about not too far, not too long ago, just about five weeks ago. They look at their notes and there they can find it. The same outline will be repeated to them. And you don't need to write any new notes because it's going to repeat everything word for word. And you can be sure if he comes back six weeks to this time, you'll still hear that thing again. That means that pastor, that preacher, is going through spiritual dryness. There is no new revelation, no new insight in the word of God. No depth of relationship. When you find yourself in your prayer life saying the same thing to God that you say every morning, there is no depth of relationship, no depth of fellowship, and it is just a repetition of your conversation you had with the Lord yesterday, last week, last month. It's one of the evidences that there is superficial life. Evidences that there is no depth of relationship. Evidence of spiritual dryness, number three. When, as preachers, we have professional look, and professional tone on the pulpit, but ordinary, carnal, selfish, shallow, graceless life at home is an evidence of spiritual dryness. Because actually, when there is a spring of water, that place looks wet. Those of us who are coming from village areas, you enter through the bush path and you get into the forest and the trees are growing. Now, if there is a spring of water nearby, you may not see that spring of water. It's hidden far, far away in the forest, but a spring of water is there. As you enter through into that forest, you see that the trees are fresh. Then you see that the ground looks a little bit wet. And the breeze, the air that blows around that area, looks very, very cool. And you see that life is fresh over here. You might walk a long distance before you see the spring of water that makes that possible. But the spring of water is somewhere. The same thing with the spiritual life. When a spring of water is there in the heart. The environment will look so fresh. And at home, the people that live at home with that individual will know that the pastor, the minister, the Christian worker has spiritual freshness. But if it's just the spiritual professional tone or look when we preach, but every other thing about that person's life, is ordinary, carnal, selfish, shallow, and graceless. That means that that person is at that time undergoing a period of spiritual dryness. Then number four, when there is formal mechanical prayer life, that lacks unction, anointing, faith, and impact. That individual is going through a period of spiritual dryness. And it is all too possible that prayer life becomes mechanical, becomes formal, that only the newcomer will be challenged by the noise of the prayer. The old members, they know that that's exactly what he always says. That's how he always prays. And it is mechanical, it is acted, it is formal, it is put on. It lacks unction. No anointing there. No faith, no impact. Number five, when there is inward 
prostration that a man is internally disenchanted and yet is performing and acting externally still ministering but within he or she is frustrated and disenchanted that person is undergoing or going through a period of spiritual dryness six when a man or a woman comes to love God's work more than God himself when a man or a woman comes to love God's work more than God himself and then imperceptibly unknown to him he has degenerated to studying the Bible primarily to find preaching material but never to apply scriptures to himself it's one of the evidences that is undergoing a period of spiritual dryness. The Bible has no food for its own spiritual life, has no water for its own spiritual thirst, has no joy for its own soul, has no guide or guidance or counseling for its own decisions. But all he does is that he loves the work of God so much that the Lord of the work is not in fellowship with him. He's lost the habit of talking to that God. Lost the relationship of having a personal intimacy with that God. All his study is only for preaching. And if there is no preaching, there will be no study. A spiritual dryness. Number seven, when the former joy, the former love, the former blessedness, the former tenderness, the former yieldedness is now unknown. That you can say, there was a time I had the joy of the Lord. When I was first converted, and if I could have it back now, I'll give anything. When he says, there was a time I had love overflowing in my heart. I loved God. I loved Christ. I loved the people. I loved music. I loved Bible. I loved evangelism. What didn't I love? I loved even the sinners, what didn't I love? Even looking at an ant, walking on the ground, it will seem as if I'm in love with that creature because of his creator. Loved everything. Loved the sun. Loved the night. Loved the day. Just look at the creation of my God. And because of my love for my God, I loved everything around and everybody around. But I wish I could be like that now. I had new love, new life. I was born again. And the blessedness, the blessedness, when I first became a believer, when I would see somebody and the person will say, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, the blessedness I'll feel in my heart towards that person. But now, you see a believer, what does it matter to you if it's a believer? But you need to understand that when the former joy, the former love, the former blessedness, the former tenderness and yieldedness. If all those things are now today not known, not experienced, the state of spiritual dryness. Number eight, when there is no ability to enjoy fellowship in the church, whenever you are not preaching, When we are preaching, we think that we enjoy the fellowship in the church. But whenever you are not preaching and you sit in the church for two hours, two and a half hours, three hours, but because you are just sitting for that Sunday, you are not preaching, everything seems too long for you. You can't enjoy it. 
sitting down in the midst of the people of God has no meaning. Standing up, singing with the people of God has no special attraction. And staying there, right in the presence of God, where we just praise the Lord, because you are not officiating and you are not ministering, that has no joy. So difficult. And you think while you are sitting there of ten other places you could be right now. That means you have lost the spiritual freshness that you had originally. There are Sundays when I'm not preaching, like last Sunday, and I could sit down in five different services. It happened that last Sunday that I prepared the outline of the message myself and gave to those that preached, said, that's what I had in mind to preach if I were to handle the Sunday worship today. But go ahead, use that outline and preach it. Now when you've done that, it, you really don't want to worship God and serve God. It will look as if somebody put you inside a cage to sit down. Seven o'clock from the morning till seven o'clock in the night, five services. What are you sitting down doing there? And last Sunday, though I didn't preach, just sitting down there, I forgot that I should take lunch on Sunday. But I wasn't preaching. My mind should have been scattered here and there since I wasn't busy that Sunday. I should be sleeping at the second service. I should be wondering what are they teaching. They are not teaching it well. But... When you understand fellowship and worship, it's not a matter of I am preaching or I am not preaching. But when the spiritual freshness is there, you'll, be, you'll have the ability to enjoy the fellowship of the church, whether you are preaching or not. And whenever you are not preaching, whenever you are not ushering, whenever you are not ministering or singing or working, you'll still enjoy that fellowship. But if you can't, it means the spiritual freshness has gone. Ephraim has lost the spiritual dew. Like the morning dew that passes away after the sun, the spiritual freshness of Ephraim had passed away. Nine. Evidence of spiritual dryness. Withdrawal of God's presence and God's favor. When God's presence is no more felt or known, when God's favor is no more felt or known, that means that that individual is passing through a state of spiritual dryness. In Hosea chapter 5, verse 6, They shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. It generally happens when a sin had been committed. And that preacher or minister will continue professionally to preach. And he will think that he can take God for granted. And fool the whole congregation. The presence of the Lord will leave. Spiritual dryness will start. What are the causes of spiritual dryness? You need to read on your own because of time. Ezekiel chapter 33. Just write it down. Verses 30 to 33. And Isaiah chapter 58. Verses 1 to 3. And verses 7 to 11. Causes of spiritual dryness. Number one. Head Bible study. With alert mind. But closed heart. Head Bible study. 
with alert mind, but closed heart. If we get into the practice of studying the Bible with the head, using the dictionary, using the commentary, using the Bible health, using the concordance, and you go through in your devotion, in your Bible study, with the head, with the intellect, with the alert, awakened mind, but with a closed heart. It will eventually result into spiritual dryness. Intellectual study, with no word from the Lord. Reading, listening, or studying as duty rather than as a means of fellowship with God. That will result into spiritual dryness. And the danger of it is that for that minister, for that pastor, he will start a wilderness experience. A wilderness experience is an experience whereby for days you can walk without having any water to quench your thirst until a Moses comes around to strike the rock. But Moses will not be living with you every day. And after Moses had gone again, you continue in your wilderness experience until you might seem as if on your own you have discovered water, but you taste it, it is bitter, undrinkable. You cannot make it sweet yourself. You'll need Moses again to put in the stick or the wood so you can drink again. And then you go on. But then you'll come to a time when you'll be hungry spiritually and you'll not have anything to feed you. Until again, Moses will have to come around. A revivalist will have to come around and bring manna from heaven. And you'll be going like that only during retreat time will you have water to drink. Only during a convention will you have food to eat. All the periods in between, you'll be dry. You'll be thirsty. You'll be hungry. That spiritual wilderness experience. And when the pastor enters into that type and stage of life, and all he gives to the congregation is coming from the head. All he offers them is with the head, without any dew or rain from heaven. The church members too will enter into a state of spiritual dryness. Because the head knowledge of the pastor cannot really feed them. Like they are living on husk and chaff. That's one reason why people get into spiritual dryness. Number two, reasons for spiritual dryness. Busy evenings and prayerless mornings. Busy evenings and prayerless mornings. Mark chapter 1, just write it down. Verses 32 to 33. Early in the morning, it was the usual practice of Jesus Christ to go away to a solitary place and pray. A usual practice, the normal practice of his life. That's how he avoided spiritual dryness. Have you noticed that most of our meetings, apart from Sunday, they're in the evening? A Bible study in the evening. And after our Bible study in the evening, we generally wait behind to counsel. And our people line up. Maybe they sit down in benches, but they line as they come. And the pastor, because he knows the need of the pastoral care and counseling over the people, he sits down. That's good. He must do it. That's part of our responsibility. But do you realize that after the Bible study, we stay late in the evening? After the revival hour, we stay late in the evening? 
if we're going to meet with the zonal leaders another day, we stay late in the evening. If our choir members are going to practice, because they must go to work in the morning. In the evening, they, they come to practice, they stay late to the evening. If we're going to have workers meeting on Saturday, sometimes we stay late in the evening. The result is that in the average deeper life church, most workers are very busy all the evenings. If the evening is followed by a prayerless morning, we'll get into spiritual dryness. I've spent all I have in the night, and while I get, as I get back home, I'm too tired to carry out any serious devotional study of the Word of God. And I sleep. I might read some verses that make no meaning. I might read some passage just to quieten my conscience that I read Bible, but that will not feed me like a man that is hungry. And just to quieten his conscience, he took some pieces of ground nut just to quieten conscience that I ate, but that will not feed you. Then you wake up in the morning, and because of responsibility, Maybe for full time pastors, the members of the church have come to knock at the door. Six o'clock in the morning, they need counseling. Busy evening, prayerless morning, there's no way you can avoid it. You'll get into the wilderness. If you are lucky, you might spend only a few days in the wilderness. If you are like most people, nothing will take a day away from 40 years of wilderness experience. If you're unlucky. Because once you enter into the wilderness, the wilderness experience has a way of drawing away all your faith, and it takes faith to come out of the wilderness. It has a way of drawing away all the sap, all the energy, all the freshness that you add, that you sang about, at the Red Sea, the wilderness has a way of sapping away the remembrance of every good thing that happened before. That's why it takes some ministers years, and take 40 years, that they would have been preaching in the first two years of their ministry. And after those first two or three years of their ministry, they become so busy. Invitation comes from here, invitation comes from there, and all those crusades and revival meetings are done in the evenings and in the mornings. The mornings are prayerless. If they are not careful, they die in the wilderness experience. The pressure of our schedule in deeper life church, the demand of our busy life, they squeeze out the real devotional prayer life. Yes, we still pray, but it is prayer for success of the work. That's not devotional prayer. And it's prayer for the people. The intimate fellowship with God has become a sin of the past. Number three. In Jeremiah chapter 7, chapter 17, verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 17. Verse 6. This is why people get into the wilderness experience. If you have a desert home and desert church environment. You know what a desert is? From Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 6. For ye shall be like the heath in the desert. I shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places, dry places, unwatered places, in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. If the home environment where you live, father, mother, children, if that home environment is an environment of unbelief and criticism, strife, argument, 
bitterness, hatred, oppression, exploitation, and suspicion. There's no way you'll avoid wilderness experience. Because there is so much to sap or to draw out of you. There is so much to depress you. So much to kill you, to destroy. That the wilderness experience will be the final result. You're surrounded in the home with unbelief. With criticism. From morning till night, you're surrounded with nagging, with criticism, with strife, with argument, with bitterness, with hatred, with oppression, with exploitation. The husband always exploiting the wife. Or the wife always exploiting the husband and with suspicion. That is a desert home environment. If you link that up with a desert church environment, that's a double desert. That in the home, the, peop the person is in the desert. Coming to the church, the person is in the desert. That's why. If anybody gets to the desert experience, the first person to get the desert experience will be the pastor. The reason is because if he has been too busy in the evenings and prayerless in the morning, if all he does now is studying the Bible only to preach, he has entered into the desert already. The next person to get into the desert experience will be the pastor's wife. The reason is because with the spiritual state of the pastor, the pastor will have unbelief. He'll be critical. He'll be a man of strife. He'll be argumentative and authoritative too. He could have hatred towards that wife. And that wife will suffer a bit of oppression at home as well as exploitation. Then, that wife has no other pastor except the husband. And she follows him to the church. And there is no spiritual food to give out in the church. Desert home environment, desert church environment, that wife will never avoid the wilderness. She'll have to, in herself, dig a well to get at water. And digging well takes time, takes energy takes strength, takes foresight. If that woman is not going to perish in the wilderness with a combination of a home like that and a church like that, it takes more than a miracle. It's almost going to take something mysteriously supernatural. That's why those of us who are married, and you know that your wife has no other church to attend, for your own sake, Settle the spiritual dryness for your life. Then for her sake, even if it is to help her get to heaven, understand that if I'm striving with this woman at home, I will send her to hell. If I'm having unbelief, criticism, strife, argument, bitterness, hatred, oppression, exploitation, suspicion, and then when I go to church, this woman has no other pastor, has no other preaching to listen to, if I don't change, I will drag this woman to hell. And if she gets to hell, there's no way you can get to heaven. No matter how many people you win to the Lord, you will never get to heaven. Her blood will be upon you. Because God knows that that woman, with her consecration before marriage, if she didn't marry you, she would have gone to heaven. Even if she didn't work for God. Even if she is not a woman leader. Well, being a woman leader is nothing. If that woman had married another person in the church, and that would be a humble man, no vehicle, maybe ordinary motorcycle, but they are happy together. And when they come to the church, since she is not pastor's wife, the pastor will preach, and since she doesn't know pastor's life, the little that the pastor preaches, she'll be able to gather some little. They that gathered little had no lack. 
She'll be able to gather some little and pray on that little and go to heaven. If by marrying you she gets to hell, you won't get to heaven. Because that will mean that you destroyed her. And you spoiled her chance of getting to heaven eternally. How can God be just and take you to heaven when you sent your wife to hell? So, the next person that could easily have spiritual dryness after the pastor will be the wife. But if we make the home environment a well-watered place, there is encouragement, there is faith, there is love, there is unity, there is appreciation, there is prayer, there is help, there is support on that woman. Uh -uh. Whatever you plant you plant near the riverside, that plant will bear fruit. But in the home, if those rivers and avenues of spiritual freshness, if they are not there, dryness will take over. And when the church dries up and the home dries up, what else are we living for? All spiritual energy has been sad. Number four, causes of spiritual dryness, fruitless worship. Isaiah chapter 5, just write that down. The time is slipping away from us. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Fruitless worship. If our worship has just become lip service, eventually there will be spiritual dryness. Number five. Write the reference for Samuel, chapter 7, verses 15 to 17. When you read that passage, you link it up with chapter 19, verses 18 to 20. For Samuel, chapter 7, verses 15 to 17, you link that up when you read the passages later with Chapter 19, verses 18 to 20. It's about Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, it says, Samuel traveled about. And we're told of the circuits, the places that he went in a row. But you wonder, how could he ever keep his spiritual life? When you read chapter 19, you discover that once in a while, Samuel will withdraw and go to a place near his own town where he had been settled or near his place of residence. And then he will have this refreshing time. He did that very often. What then do we learn from that? Number five reason of spiritual dryness is this. Constant traveling without any refreshment a refreshing, replenishing personal program of spiritual growth. Constant traveling without any refreshing, replenishing personal program of spiritual growth. What that means is this. When you travel very often as a businessman, or you travel very often as a state overseer or as a pastor, it disorganizes you. You are in another person's home. And because that is the new environment, to have your quiet time the way you ought to have it, you may not be able to have. In your own home environment, if you are having quiet time, devotion, I mean a devotion of the minister, not just of the ordinary Christian. You might need, while you are having the devotional time, a Bible dictionary. You might need a cassette. You might need another thing. You just go there and take it. And you are fresh. That thing keeps you alive. 
when you travel very, very often, there is a limit to how many books you can carry with you, how many cassettes you can carry with you. You will think, this is all I need. And now you have traveled to that place and you are there. The things that should keep you fresh, you are not able to have. If you travel often and you, are, you happen to be a respected minister of the gospel that people appreciate, like for example, myself, as a general superintendent, when I travel out, people love me, they respect me. And because I've not come there for a long time, they want to do their best to overfeed me. And it's part of their care. They want to do their best to give me a nice environment. It's part of their care. They want to do their best also to make sure that they are not uh, trying to get the people away from me. They tell all their people, a generous superintendent is around. And I've been doing my best for you as a pastor. But the GS is around. He can counsel anybody on any subject. Line up. And when... You feed more than you fed at home, and you pray less than you prayed at home. The combination of more feeding and less prayer will enter into spiritual dryness. When you travel around as a preacher, that's why in all the work that we do, apostle, prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, the first person of all those offices to dry up will be the evangelist. He travels a lot. He is busy a lot. One, because he's an evangelist, he's not a teacher. He doesn't have to study the Bible too much. He can repeat the same five messages on the crusade that he preached somewhere before and preach the same five evangelistic messages today, and people will still get saved. He's always preaching salvation message. Because of that, he has no death. And he'll go dry. Not only that, his crusades are in the evenings. And he preaches. And an evangelist does not preach like a pastor. An evangelist preaches with all his strength, with all his ability. And he sweats a lot. By the time he finishes that night, he is drenched in sweat. And then he counsels. If it's a person who is given to counseling after the evangelistic meeting, then he goes to a place where they put him. Because they invited him to be an evangelist, they put him maybe in a hotel, or they put him in a good apartment. There is good feeding. There is busy evening. There will be prayerless morning. There will be lack of study. That's why the evangelist, among all those people that were, that were told about in Ephesians, is the first one to dry up. The pastor, if he's just a pastor and not an administrative uh, person as well, who supervises, he stays in his church, wakes up in his home in the morning. With some little care, he should be able to have his quiet time. With some little deliberate plan, he should be able to bring up himself. But the danger is very great for traveling itinerant evangelists. Constant traveling without any refreshing. And you know, my brothers and sisters, many times when you look at deeper life as a church, you might wonder that if I were in another place, I will have more liberty. Yes, in some sense, you'll have more liberty to dry up. You see, other evangelists and pastors in other denominations, they travel a lot. They go to America, they go to Britain, and then they will talk to you and say that they preached uh, Wonderful messages. And they spent four weeks overseas. But if they spend their lives like that, they'll dry up. I travel 
And I know what happens when we travel. In October, September stroke October, I went to Britain. And when I got there, every evening I was preaching. Only that, because I know all that I'm talking to you on now, I can regulate my life. But they were asking me. They wanted to do everything to just please me. They said, do you know this place in London? I said, no. Oh, they said, you have to be there. Have you seen this park in London? I said, no. Ah, but you said you came in 1974. I said, yes. I didn't go around too much. They said, we will take you there. And they arranged with different people. This one to bring his vehicle this time. This one to bring his vehicle that time. But how many of those places I went? Not one. If I did, I won't have anything to preach when I came back. But it was still busy. After preaching in the evening and then counseling, I would have an engagement in another place that will take me three hours journey. And that engagement, that morning will be nine o'clock in the morning, making me to wake up at five o'clock, not for quiet time, but for traveling. That same day, I have a, an evening meeting in London, about seven o'clock in the evening. So when I finish there, I have to take another three uh, hours uh, journey and come back. Now, if I didn't know how to regulate my life, I will not be a Christian again, not even to talk of a preacher. And going to America, the same thing. That you're having some crusades, or you're having some revival meetings. And those who have heard about me would say, we have already uh, booked appointment with a radio station. Others will book appointment with this television uh, program that they need to listen to what is going on in Nigeria. Now, if I didn't know how to regulate my life, it's so easy to dry up. But in deeper life, we've done it in such a way that our pastors are not free just to go anywhere they like at any time. Because of that, we keep you at home. We keep you on your church. We tell you there's enough work here for you to do. Do it. I have letters of invitations that are lined up now in Nigeria and outside Nigeria. And the ones I'm able to honor, I honor. The ones I'm not able to honor, I put aside. There's a letter waiting now for Singapore, another for Thailand, in Bangkok. But for the one in Singapore, obviously, I won't go. Because it's February. And all these programs we have written down that we're having, after my going through all that we're going through at the Congress now, and I still have to preach five services this coming Sunday, still have to have Bible study two times a week, uh, two times uh, on Monday, so that they don't feel that this is a new year and the pastor is resting. Because they won't know that we have been in the Congress. Only a few people know that we are the Congress. The thousands of people, they don't know that. Just like yesterday, if I said I was here preaching because of the Congress, and I didn't go to town for the uh, fasting and praying day, they won't understand. They will think that the pastor is resting. Because of that, I have to follow that tight schedule. If I follow that tight schedule, I have to give up that one in Singapore. But most ministers are not intelligent enough to know which one to give up. I'll give up the one in Singapore because I'm only invited there to come and hold three days meeting, two meetings every day, making six messages. After I preach for three days, I'll come back home. I don't know what the person that is going to preach to them after me will preach to them. Whether I will approach what I planted, whether he will completely burn up what I have established, because I'm not sure of that, but I'm sure of this, that's why I stay here. But many people are not wise that way. 
they like traveling. But when you travel like that, if you are not careful, it destroys your life. You will be popular on earth, but you will not be popular in heaven. So constant traveling without any refreshing, replenishing personal program of spiritual growth will dry up the spring until there is no fresh water for the thirsty. There must always be personal retreat in your life. Maybe once a week. That you'll just stay back at home. Spare those of you are full time. Read your Bible. If possible, fast. Wait upon the Lord. Then you'll have more insight into the scriptures. You'll have more fellowship with the Lord. Number six. Backsliding. Backsliding causes spiritual dryness. Well, you might say, well, yes, it ought to cause spiritual dryness, but it's not like that. If somebody backslides, that all of a sudden, because of a careless moment, the person went into sin. But very quickly, immediately, he prays and he says, Lord, you know how much I love you and how much I want to love you. And this devil has cheated me like this. Lord, even if I will die, I cannot lose your presence. Have mercy on me. And that person weaves and cries like a baby, holding on the horns of the altar. And say, God, save me back. And even if you like, after saving me, kill me and take me to heaven. God cannot allow such a backslider to enter into the wilderness. It's a precious soul. It's a tender person. But a person who backslides goes into sin and becomes hardened. And he will murmur. And he will talk and criticize everybody. And he knows that he has backslidden if he ever comes back to take a miracle. And so all these things cause spiritual dryness. You can read the reference later on this. Amos chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. What's the cure? Number one, that is the cure of spiritual dryness. Return unto God. Number two, Pray for revival. Personal, life-changing revival. And plead like Habakkuk pleaded in chapter 3, verse 2. Lord, send revival. In the midst of judgment, remember mercy. Number three, take care of your spiritual surrounding. Make sure that from now on, you are planted in the midst of many waters. Number four, live in an atmosphere and environment of faith, balanced trust in God. Number five, take delight in God's word. Obey God daily in small, minor things as well as in big, major things. And separate yourself from sinners and scoffers. Number six, wait upon the Lord. Have a personal retreat once in a while before your spiritual energy is, is completely exhausted. In Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40, from verse 28, Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. 
and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If we do these things, God will make a way out of our wilderness. And after he has brought us into the spring and into the streams of waters, if we keep on doing all these things, that will make us to avoid spiritual dryness and will keep fresh spiritually till we see Jesus face to face. Let's rise up and pray. Our God, we are grateful to you for what you have opened our eyes to see and our ears to hear at this hour. O oh Lord, I know that by your grace, as we remain obedient to what we have heard, we will never run dry again in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that all these satanic baits by which he has been drawing, out of the, drawing us out of the closet, that we have busy evenings and prayerless mornings, that, Lord, they will never have any grip on us again in Jesus' name. All those coming to us very early in the morning for counseling and prayers, and we are not able to settle with you, God, Lord, I pray, will never treat you that way from now on in Jesus' name. Our prayers and study of the scripture will not be only to get materials for preaching, but a devotional type that, Lord, will have real and rich fellowship with you in Jesus' name. Father, we are returning back unto you. All the errors of the past, forgive us in Jesus' name. And, Lord, as you are forgiving us, Revive our souls and spirits in Jesus' name. And Lord, make us like the tree planted by the riverside, that our truth, our roots are ever receiving water, drawing sap from the grace of the Almighty God, our branches ever standing, our leaves ever green, our fruits coming out in the right season, and all that we ever do for you will prosper to the glory of your name. Lord, make it so in Jesus' name. By now, Lord, you have energized us. And as we continue with you, the strength will keep flowing. And we'll mount up with wings as eagles. And we'll keep on flying and we'll not come down again. In